Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, my way is on forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'll be taking a look at the Cobra Missile Command Headquarters. This was a cardboard playset which came with three figures. Cobra Commander, a Cobra Officer, and a Cobra Soldier, although called a Cobra Trooper on the box. This was a Sears exclusive, available only in United States and Canada, and was issued in 1982 as well as 1983, but with some changes for that second release. Now obviously, the second release has swivel arm battle grip versions of the same figures, but it's rather odd that they didn't change anything about the box to indicate that you got the upgraded figures for that second year. So it's really hard to tell with sealed examples which year your particular uh, headquarters actually comes from. Now I know a lot of collectors really don't like the um, Missile Command headquarters because it's a cardboard playset and that seems kind of cheap. But there is actually a history to that and why it is the way it is. So what's up with the full cardboard playsets anyway? Well, it all started with the Star Wars Cantina Adventure playset back in 1979. And I use the term playset sarcastically here. Kenner had already released a proper playset called the Creature Cantina, very similar in look. So why does this exist alongside it? Well, it was Sears' idea. They wanted to volume sell action figures, but have consumers pay full price per character. In a multi-pack, the consumers expect the retailer to pass volume discounts onto them. But Sears found a way around that by adding perceived value in the form of a playset. And the cheapest way to make a playset? Well, make it out of cardboard, of course. This one was really more of a backdrop with literally no play features, and whose manufacturer couldn't have added more than 50 cents to the full cost. Marketed as a playset, consumers were tricked into paying full price for what is essentially a figure multipack. Sears wasn't being completely evil though. They chose to use figures that Kenner wouldn't release until the next wave. These were all the generic alien figures that Kenner wasn't sure would sell quite as well as the previous wave, which was made up of entirely known characters from the movie. So this was the earliest way you could get those particular figures. This is known today as a pre-release exclusive. It was a huge success, and Sears followed it up with the 1980 Cloud City playset. When Hasbro's G.I. Joe line started in 1982, none of the Cobra bad guys were available. They would be a second wave release. Cobra Commander was a mail-in exclusive, and Hasbro always made bad guys in lower quantities than the good guys. So finding them at retail, even at the time, was tough. Different problem for the Star Wars figures, but the same answer. Offer consumers a multi-pack, but sell them for full price, and disguise that fact by marketing it as a playset which happens to come with all the hard-to-find figures that you wanted. At the time, Hasbro's G.I. Joe creative team Credo was to one-up Kenner at their own game. So when Sears asked for a cheap cardboard backdrop, what Hasbro delivered was closer to a true playset, but probably cost as little as Kenner's attempts. And here is the end result, an 11 inch tall by 20 inch wide paper craft playset with multiple levels. And just to give you an idea of the scale, here is a 3 and 3 quarter inch figure. So you can see this is actually a very large base when fully put together. The playset has several raised platforms, just moving the cruise missile out of the way. It has a platform here. As a matter of fact, that's a large platform, which you can fit several figures on there. But it also has a platform here, as well as one right there. Just taking a closer look at all that amazing Ron Rudat ink and watercolor art. Kind of the same detail that you might find on the paper stickers of the 1983 G.I. Joe headquarters, as well as the 1982-1983 Cobra Battle game. Check out 3D Joe's website to see the preliminary sketch for this in black and white. It's just amazing looking in color. Although sadly there's no artwork on the back of the playset. 
On the bottom left we have a large computer control panel here which seats three figures. Each of the seats, although made out of just folded cardboard like the rest of the playset, is actually adjustable by about an inch. and go in and out a little bit. Taking a look at the seats by themselves. Again, they didn't skimp on the detail here. And as you can see, the panel, although it has a big flat wall here, actually does have cutouts for the figure's feet. So they do actually fit in here rather well. And of course, the star of the Missile Command Headquarters is the Cobra Cruise Missile, which you can just raise and lower. And it pivots right there on that white plug here which unfortunately is really the only thing keeping this thing um, in place. It has to have a lot of tightness here in order to maintain the friction to be able to hold it in whatever angle that you want it to be in. And while it's very highly detailed like the rest of the playset, it is unfortunately just a flat piece. It is not three-dimensional in any shape, way, or form. Rather unfortunate. It's also non-removable. And moving the cruise missile fully out of the way, we gain access to the elevator. Or rather, it's an elevator car. Able to support actually four figures. I will just put the three included ones here. But there is definitely room for about four, I would say. And not only does it move upwards, it actually moves sideways as well on the rail. And they actually suggest that it moves that way in order for the figures to gain access to the uh, inner workings of the cruise missile in order to repair it or program it. Despite the elevator being behind the cruise missile, the cruise missile is not actually obstructed by the elevator. While the integrity of the entire playset structure is sort of dependent on all the components being, you know, together, it's not actually dependent on the control panel being inserted. So you can actually remove it and have it somewhere else if you don't want it right there. You can also see even more detail right behind the panel where they really didn't have to put any detail there, but they did. But wait, there's more. In addition to the base and the figures, you also got a file card holder. Oddly enough, the file card holder is not mentioned at all on the instructions, nor is it shown how to put this thing together. But as you can see, it has the same construction as like a tissue box, so it really shouldn't need instructions. Taking a closer look, it has really nice graphics on here, especially the ones which look to be taken from the back of the figure card um, packages. The back and the bottom is rather plain, however. And the hole is big enough just to hold about a dozen figure file cards. That's just about three right there. You can see it has quite a bit of space. As a matter of fact, some people over the years have actually stuffed so many cards in there that the edges down along here kind of rip forward. There is actually a lot of empty space like right in this chunk here. So honestly, you can just still open up the sides and put gear in there or even extra figures. I guess it's really up to you how you really want to use this thing. However, because this thing is more like a role-playing item rather than part of the, I guess, the action figure part of the base, there's nowhere really to put it on the base. So people often just lost this thing or misidentified it altogether. It's like something that would have come with like the membership fan club 
rather than with a toy. And this is how the 1982 figures were packaged inside the box. They all came sealed on their file cards, red-backed file cards, in little bubbles, kind of like the way drivers would be on uh, vehicle boxes. Of course, the little brown box that they all were squished into was also home to the uh, catalog. For the most part, I'm not really going to go in-depth for with the figures because, well, they're exactly the same as uh, what we had before. I'd already done a review on Cooper Commander, and this Cooper Commander is no different from the one that you got from the mail-away. And these two are no different from the retail ones which were on the cards. The only real difference here is the file cards themselves, which were unique, of course. They had this... Uh, black border, and the 6200 in the corner. Even the information on the actual file card themselves were really no different from what you got with the mail away, or in the case of the Cobra Officer and the Cobra Soldier. Again, the text was exactly the same as how it was on the retail card. And just taking a quick look at the figures outside of their little bubbles, you can see that my version of the Cobra Commander actually has the variant first run Mickey Mouse type Cobra symbol. But he was available with the regular symbol as well. Quite frankly, I think they liquidated quite a lot of these Mickey Mouse versions of the symbol um, during the time that they were doing the mail away. So you might actually have a higher chance of getting the Mickey Mouse symbol uh, figure in the Missile Command headquarters rather than just through the uh, regular mail away. But that's just my opinion. Of course, these two are exactly the same. They all have the same accessories. They're pretty much interchangeable with what you got uh, through mail away or retail. As I mentioned before, the Missile Command Headquarters released the following year included swivel arm battle grip versions of the same three figures. These figures were sealed in individual bags with file cards that had white borders with the 6200 assortment numbers on them. The cardboard insert box was also marked differently too. The 1982 version simply had the 8 digit part number printed on it while the 1983 version had the 6200 assortment number printed on it. This is also where the Hasbro toy catalog was stored in both cases. Missile Command headquarters that were damaged or returned to Sears had the conveniently separated insert box removed to be sold individually as early as late 1983, while still advertising the playset in Sears catalogs. But it seems by 1984, Sears did have enough confidence in the G.I. Joe brand to sell the excess Cobra figures, honestly, as a three-pack. And just to compare the first and second releases, or basically the straight arm versions versus the swivel arm versions. Again, the swivel arm versions are no different from what you got on the retail card. Take a look at these. That is the swivel arm metal grip right there, the mid-bicep articulation. And of course the butt is marked 8283. As opposed to the originals which only had the elbow joint. And were marked 1982 in full. And all the figures were kind of like that. If you're looking for a Missile Command Headquarters on the aftermarket, I'm sorry to say, but this is one of the most valuable G.I. Joe playsets ever made. Despite the fact that it's made out of purely cardboard, a flat cardboard at that. So you might think that there might be scans online, and there are. The website, The Cobra Temple, has actually made very high quality scans of each individual part. So if you're adventurous, you might be able to uh, print these out on a color printer. But any scan and any self-made print is just not going to be the same uh, to the naked eye as the original. So this thing has really kept its value. What you see here is probably worth around $500 as I'm making this video. But that's also because of the figures, the file cards, and the file card holder. As well as you can't really replicate those uh, little white knobs which hold the elevator and the cruise missile on. <laughs> you can't uh, print those out on a color printer, unfortunately. Now, if you're 
looking to get one, and you actually do have the money, you do have a choice of whether you want the straight arm or swivel arm versions. And of course, the uh, file cards were different for each version. Oh, and did I mention how difficult it is to find the instruction sheet for this? It's only a single page, but because it didn't have blueprints on it, a lot of the kids who actually collected the blueprints from their play sets and vehicles didn't keep this one. So this is actually fairly rare in itself, too. To be clear, I bought my set about 20 years ago, when G.I. Joe wasn't quite as popular as it is today. So I only paid about a fraction of the price. However, you should be able to find sellers who really don't do the research and maybe sell parts or even the entire set as something other than the Missile Command Headquarters. I've even seen parts go for not very much because they are mislabeled as puzzle parts or just parts from like a membership kit or something like that when really they should have been listed as a Sears exclusive playset. So it's not impossible to find a set like this, but it is really hard and you do have to do a lot of legwork sometimes. Despite its simplicity, there are two reasons why I really like this set. The first is, well, it's a Sears exclusive and I've always really liked Sears, to be honest. The other thing is, it's actually very flat. So maybe as a kid it wouldn't be a whole that spectacular, but as an adult with limited shelf room, this thing's flat and really fits close against a shelf. So you're able to actually put this well into a shelf and have a lot of room for all your other G.I. Joes to be displayed around it. Where this doesn't usually happen. I'm sure this wasn't intended, but there's actually some empty space right underneath the elevator and right underneath the missile. So you can actually hide a figure in here. Just a whoops. Taking a quick look at the figures, like the Cobra Officer for. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.